Okay. During the war, the Museum of Modern Art was full of wonderful Picasso works that had been deliberately sent over here from Europe to protect them from the war. Oh, I didn't realize that I was, what I was seeing, but oh, I, everybody went to the, the Museum of Modern Art. Everybody went to the galleries. Everybody, and, and in those days, because I was at the Art Students League, which is on 57th, and just by good luck, every gallery in New York was also on 57th Street. Now the galleries are all over the city. Actually, now they're all in Chelsea, or most of them. Anyway, in those days, we were all, in, and everybody, we wouldn't go together, but we would run into each other. Then I had my children and I sort of retired, but in the 50s when my kids were in school and, I, and all, the, um, all the excitement in the art world was on the uh, what the, uh, East 10th Street, all the galleries, uh, the uh, uh, wonderful galleries really were on East 10th Street. And I wanted to be part of that, but I couldn't be as an artist because I didn't. I was just taking care of my children. Anyway, I talked. There was a group of losers in the art world who couldn't get a gallery, so they got together and made their own gallery. And they opened it on 10th Street, and I went over there and talked myself into being the the lady who sits at a desk. You know, no salary. Uh, but I would get a commission if I sold any of that junk. Now, what it was in those days, all, all these guys, all these artists would come in there and talk and moan and complain. They were very bitter because they weren't making the piles and piles of money that a few artists were making. I mean, a few were really making out. But these guys were, and, and all they talked about was they they had to find a gimmick, and that is something new, you know, to, uh, because it was all abstract, of course. The gimmick could be anything. And every once in a while, uh, one of them would, uh, would you wouldn't let anybody visit him. I mean, for months, you wouldn't let anyone come to his studio because he was afraid they would steal his gimmick, you know. And in truth, this actually happened to, to one of the, the big artists who were making money. The thing is, this guy, a guy had <clears throat> made like 20 paintings with just dots on it, you know. That was his deep thought, dots, you know. And by the time he, he was ready for the, uh, an exhibition, uh, another artist came up and already exhibited Twombly, T-W-O-M-B-Y or something like that. Twombly did, and it, and it broke this other guy's heart. And then at about that time, Jackson Pollock, one of the billionaire guys who was making a fortune, managed to kill himself in a car crash. This was out in East Hampton. And immediately after he died, his wife wouldn't let the reporters or anyone visit her. She was, as she said, that she was in deep mourning and couldn't handle any visitors. Well, as all the artists knew what she was doing. What she was doing, she was doing like crazy as fast as she could. The same stuff her husband did, you know. With, she probably used to help him, you know, put the canvas on the floor and pour the paint on it. Because she knew that uh, afterwards she could sell all that stuff as his work. And she had to keep people out for about a week because after you pour one color, you have to wait till it dries before you didn't pour the other one, etc., etc. 
plus get all the smell of turpentine out of the room. Uh, anyway, what was I going to say? Only one of those guys, you know, who complained. I mean, these guys were bitter, uh, uh, you know, that they couldn't. Only one of them managed to get a, a gimmick that got him into a, a position where he could make a lot of money. It was Al Held. At that time, what he was doing is he was just using a knife and putting swabs of paint on the canvas and what have you. I, there was, after the, you know, uh, when the, even before the war was over, the guys were beginning, some guys were beginning to come home. And one of those guys was, was the handsomest guy in the world. His name was Sidney. And he had the gift of gab. And he could talk about art in such an exquisite, wonderful way. I mean, 15 years later, he got a job teaching at Vassar, you know? And anyway, he, he had a studio down, downtown. And all his girlfriends were uh, from the power of rich debutantes who hung around the, the lake. And one summer, uh, he, uh, one of the, uh, not, not a debutante, it was a, a, a lady making sculpture. Her name was Louise Nevelson. She was wealthy. She invited him to her uh, summer home up in the uh, Woods Hole, I think it was called, up in Massachusetts. And when he, when he was done, and this, uh, uh, he, uh, he couldn't bring his sculpture down. What his sculpture was was a, a very tall tree that he was carving into. It was too tall to fit in his studio, so he asked me if he could send it into my studio because I had been at a, a, a store. I didn't want an apartment, I wanted a store so I could pretend I was still making sculpture. I mean, I was a crummy artist. But it was perfect for Sydney. So he had his uh, sculpture in there and he, you know, he had totally ignored me before. He had gone to France to come back and before he went to France, he totally ignored me, but when he came back, he saw my situation. My situation was I had two little baby boys, uh, little Noah and little Andrew. And Sydney got a real crush on me because I didn't know it at the time, but he had a short little mother with two sons. So anyway. While he was at my studio, like, he was there like for a year and a half, the phone was always ringing and it was Louise Nevelson. Now, Louise Nevelson later became a very super famous rich. She was already rich, she didn't care about the money, but super famous, that she didn't care about. And she would call begging to talk to Sydney. You know, I, I practically had to do a phone service for her in Sydney. And Sydney, in the meantime, Sydney went from woman to woman. I mean, he could because women loved to listen to him talk. I, I can't explain just how wonderful his talk was. He knew so much about art. And when he, came, he, when he went to France, when he came back, he had written a book on Brancusi. And anyway, he pretty much ignored Louise. I want to take a rest now, Andy. While I was working at the gallery on East 10th Street, Bosco came in. Bosco was one of these super famous, rich, artist whose who, uh, abstract style was simply putting a few colors right on top of each other in very large canvases. 
uh, and, and he would come in and you would think that the these other artists, these bums, you know, these losers would cluster around him and worship him. No, no, no. Nobody worshipped anybody because everybody knew it was just a gimmick. They hated Vosco when he came in. They glared at him and wouldn't even talk to him. But he, but he did as he sat down, you know, and, and he, he started to talk out loud to all of everybody that was there about how he couldn't paint anymore. Because if he even made one more painting, it would put him into a tax bracket that would be overwhelming, you know. And so he was really suffering at home because he couldn't, he wasn't allowed to paint anymore. I, it just made everybody hate him. Anyway, that was Rothko. It, <laughs> I think that's funny. Okay. Luis was so in, so intent on making me his buddy, you know, so so I could help him get closer to Sydney, that she invited me up to her house. Today in Manhattan we have a, a, a group of apartment builders, I think it's called Kips Bay, where in those days it was a row of wonderful, expensive brownstone, privately owned homes. And uh, Louise owned one of these. So I brought my two little kids up with me. My, uh, one was a baby and one was a toddler. And gee, it was, her house was so wonderful. I mean, the kitchen was enormous. It, it had a back door and you open, went into the garden. Now, the garden was one of these gardens that you, sh that these, they shared with the next block. You know, every two blocks had the same backyard. And so it, the garden was like a park. And it was beautifully done. And I was really impressed. It was a pleasure. Oh, and around that time, Sidney, who knew everybody, and everybody loved him, everybody loved his gab had arranged for his friend uh, Seymour Hacker, who owned a bookstore on 58th Street, to turn his bookstore into an art gallery. So I, I would, I, he picked one of my sculptures to show, and everyone was able to show two pieces of sculpture. And uh, of course there was Sidney, there was me, there was Louise, there was Chamberlain. Chamberlain's a very big name now. What he did then is what he does now, which is simply crush automobiles. I mean, literally go to some place that crushes automobiles, they crush the automobile, he'd take it and he'd put it on a stand. And anyway, he's very famous today for crushed automobiles. Anyway, I only have one little brochure from that. I hope I hope it isn't lost. I mean, I think that was very nice of Sydney. Oh, by the way, uh, the New Yorker magazine reviewed the uh, <laughs> exhibit and the only artist they mentioned by name was me. Isn't that nice? I mean, that is nice. I, I was at the uh, at the galleries once with Sidney, but it's on 57th Street. We would look, and we would go in and he would immediately go to a couple pieces on the wall and stand there in, in, in awe. And, and I was at his elbow and I said, Sidney, how could you tell the good stuff from the bad stuff? You know, it was, it was all abstract. And he looked at me and, you know, and he says, Francis, it isn't what the painting says to you, it's what you say to the painting. You know, and I looked at him and I pretended I understood what he was saying. Of course, I don't to this day understand it. 